Welcome to Archeo Ed, a podcast about ancient civilizations in the Americas. I'm your host, Dr. Ed Barnard and I've been an archaeologist all around the Americas for over 20 years now. In this podcast, I'm going to talk about ancient civilizations that I find interesting. Sometimes it'll be overviews, sometimes it'll be very in-depth information, basically anything I feel like talking about, because this is my podcast and I'm just having fun with it. I hope you enjoy it too. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and let's get started. Episode 5, Easter Island, one of my favorite places on the planet. I've been there twice, and I'm looking forward to many more visits. The island is famous for its Moai statues, these massive, multi-ton statues depicting humans. There's a lot of myths, misunderstandings, and really outright falsehoods about what those Moai represent. And I'll address those in this podcast. But first... Before I do that, I'd like to discuss the place and its people. Easter Island is one of the most remote places on the planet. It's way out in the southern Pacific. It's 2,800 miles from the nearest landfall in South America, and even the closest island, Pitcairn Island, is 1,300 miles away. It is literally in the middle of nowhere. The first misunderstanding I'd like to address is the island's name. Its inhabitants didn't originally call it Easter Island. That name was invented by the first Europeans who documented landing there. They landed on Easter Day. That was Dutch explorer Jacob Rogveen, who found it by accident on April 5, 1722. The other name commonly used for the island, and the culture of its inhabitants, is Rapa Nui. But that, too, was imposed by Europeans. That name was invented by slave raiders of the 1860s, who thought it looked like another Polynesian island called Rapa. Rapa Nui simply means Big Rapa. When the local people are asked, they say that the island's name is Tepito, or Navel of the World. Whatever you want to call it, the island is a tiny place. The entire triangle-shaped landmass is only 15 by 17 miles in area, and a lot of that is taken up by three big volcanoes. Those volcanoes are really three giant pillars lifting it out of the water. The ocean floor below is 6,600 feet deep. Not only do those volcanoes hold the tiny island up, Their crater lakes provide most of its fresh water. Regardless of their religious motivations, Polynesians were right to respect and revere their volcanoes. The Rapa Nui people, which for better or worse is what they call themselves these days, are the farthest out group of the wider cultural group known as Polynesians. When exactly they arrived to populate the island is still a matter of debate. As early as 300 CE and as late as 1200 CE have been published theories. From archaeology, we have really solid dates from at least 900 CE and less solid but believable dates as early as 600 CE. Either of those carbon-14 derived dates makes Easter Island the last of the Polynesian islands to be inhabited. And by the way, not to be confusing, but I prefer the name Rapa Nui, so I'll be calling the island that from now on in this podcast. I know it's also not the island's original name, but it is the term that the surviving inhabitants have adopted for both the land and themselves. Thus, out of respect for their decisions, I go with Rapa Nui. Now, aside from what archaeology tells us about the island's original inhabitation, the Rapa Nui people have their own account of its establishment. They humbly call it oral tradition, and they actually have a vast collection of stories about their entire history. If you listen to the modern-day Rapa Nui people, they have explanations about a great many things. Things like what the Moai are, how they moved them, 
even things like who lived in which houses and what their names were. But for some strange reason, many scholars have listened to those stories and concluded, uh, so it's still a mystery, eh? I think it's downright rude, but whatever. Oral tradition states that the island was first settled by a chief named Hotu Matua. His priest, Haumaka, saw it in a dream, and scouts were sent out to find it. Once located, Hotumatua led a larger expedition of two passenger canoes, and they landed at Anakena Beach, the nicest and most protected cove on the island's northern side. They say that they came from an island called Hiva, though no one's really sure which island that is. A lot of people think it's the Marquesas. But regardless of from where or when they arrived, we know that it was by a fleet of beautiful catamarans and seaworthy canoes. And we know that they were there for long enough for their spoken language to diverge from the other Polynesian spoken languages. Oral tradition tells us that Hotumatua was the first king, or a riki and that his sons went out to establish their own communities around the island. Eventually, they became at least nine distinct clan territories, and probably a few more before they were first documented by Europeans. Those clans eventually teamed up into two unequal groups. The bigger, more powerful group was the Ko Tu'u Aro, and the smaller, sort of subordinate group, was the Hotu Iti. But remember, they were all ultimately from a single progenitor, Hotu Matua, so they felt like one big family. The biggest clan with the most territory was the Miru clan, and not surprisingly, that was the one tied back to Akahena Beach and Hotu Matua himself, rather than one of his son's clans. At some point, long after the clans had been established and their individual territories had been claimed, another group of people arrived to Rapa Nui. Oral tradition calls them the long ears because of their distinctive kind of earrings and how it elongated their earlobes. They were begrudgingly accepted, but made to inhabit a small territory on the island's northeast corner underneath Volcano Poike. All of the clan villages are near the shoreline, but their territories extend inland. The boundaries of where one village's land end and another's begin are hard to detect archaeologically, but oral tradition confirms that they did indeed exist. Oral tradition also tells us that major sections of the island's center were considered no one's land, or everyone's, and people of any clan were free to traverse it but not to build on it. Rapa Nui is a tiny place, so land was obviously a precious commodity. The habitation areas of each village were clustered along the coastlines, and the interior parts were used for subsistence activities. Their houses were mostly called Harry Panengas, or boat houses, named as such for their elliptical shape. It looked a little like uh, the shape of a canoe. They had stone-built bases with post holes that held wooden-framed walls, and they were topped with grass roofs. Away from the shore, on lands gently sloping towards the volcanoes, were the farmlands. But the island's soil in most places was shallow and rocky, so they developed big garden plots called manavai. A manavai was a circular stone-walled enclosure within which soil was piled up, and it was protected that way from wind erosion. That was where they planted taro, sweet potatoes, and other edible plants. And I said, did. The modern Rapa Nui people still do. The other stone constructions of the interior lands were hare moa, or chicken coops. There are hundreds of them dotting the landscape. Hari moas are rectangular, about a meter or two in height, and typically about two by one meters in length and width. 
They're ingeniously built with hollow areas inside for the chickens to spend the night. A stone at the base can be removed to let the chickens in and out, and stones on the top are lifted to reveal where they lay their eggs. Between chickens, garden plots, and fishing, the Rapanui had enough food to support a growing population, and some say that it reached up to 15,000 people. It's hard to say exactly when, especially since we're still debating when the first Rapa Nui arrived, but at some point they began carving and erecting their famous moai. When I return from our first break, I'll tell you what I know about that. This break is where commercials should go, but until I find people who'd like to buy the time, I'll just promote what I'm doing. If you like the cultures and places I'm talking about in this podcast, you should consider traveling with my colleagues and I. I'm the director of Maya Exploration Center, a nonprofit dedicated to the better understanding of ancient American civilizations. We do that through things like this podcast, our website, public lectures, and educational travel programs like I just mentioned. If you'd like to find out more about how to get involved, or just give us a donation to continue our work, check us out at www.mayaexploration.org. That's mayaexploration.org. Okay, I'm back and ready to talk about Moai. The pictures on TV and in magazines make it look like there are a few dozen of these statues on the island. But the truth is surprising. Wikipedia will tell you there's 887, but there's actually over 900 now with pieces recalculated and new excavations. Some people say that it might be over a thousand now. Even at the island's peak population of possibly 15,000, that's one moai per 15 people. It's honestly still an unanswered question in my head. Why the heck did they make so many? Not only are there many, many moai, but they're all huge, even the small ones. When we average them out, the typical moai stands about 13 feet tall and weighs about 13 tons. The tallest on the island stands 33 feet tall, and the locals call him Paro. The quarry has one that was never finished, but if it was, it would have stood 69 feet tall and weighed about 150 tons. By the way, can I say how much I wish America would adopt the metric system? I know that I have to speak in terms of feet and tons for my mostly American audience, but the clean base 10 metric system is just flat out superior. I don't know. Write your senator or something. All but 53 of the over 900 moai were carved out of the same place, the Rana Raraku Crater. The island is a triangle, and its three corners are the three biggest volcanoes rising up from the ocean floor. The fourth biggest is inland, and that's the Rana Raraku Crater. The locals make fun of how tourists can never say it right. I had a guide once say, in an American accent, Rana Ruku. One specific clan controlled and lived around Rana Ruraku, which gave them significant clout. Any other clan who wanted to make a new Moai had to commission it from them. They were carved from the volcanic tuft of the crater and then transported to the various villages. I'll talk about how they might have moved them in a moment, but first, let's talk about where they ended up. Typically, the moai were arranged in rows along the coastline. The postcard image is the 15 all standing in a row at Tongariki. They were erected atop platforms called ahus. Again, typically, but not always, they stood with their backs to the ocean and looking out over the clan village main plaza. Along the rest of the plaza edges would be the clan houses, elliptically shaped hare panengas. 
so the Moai were looking at, perhaps even protecting, the community. Lately, a theory has been circulating that the Moai are oriented in a way to point out where the island's fresh water sources are. But the Rapa Nui I've talked to scoff at that hypothesis. One joked with me saying, yeah, we're such dumb natives that we kept forgetting where our fresh water was, so we built 20-ton statues to remind us. That freshwater theory is the latest in a long list of Western ideas about why the Moai were built, ranging from witchcraft to alien contact. But as with everything else on the island, Rapa Nui oral tradition has totally reasonable answers. The Rapa Nui say that the Moai are images of their ancestors, specifically honored chiefs who have passed on. They were carved, transported, erected, and given the name of the chief they honor. Many of the Moai still have the names that modern Rapa Nui people remember. The Moai remained rocks until the moment that their shell and obsidian eyes were added. Then they woke up as the spirit of the ancestor they represented. At that point they emanated mana, a special life force that was a power that all Rapa Nui could access, but especially chiefs harnessed it to wisely lead. The descendants of those Moai ancestors living in the village could receive and benefit from the mana radiating from the statues. If the shell eyes were ever removed, so was the spirit and the associated mana. It was just a rock again. And this wasn't something that the Rapa Nui came up with on their own. The concept of mana is pan-Polynesian. So is the concept of a platform as the focal point of a public plaza. On other Polynesian islands, that platform is called a mare. Marais are rectangular platforms in open public areas used for religious ceremonies and sometimes regular things like weddings or holiday parties, but most importantly, they were used for funerals. Just like Ahus, they were the touch points connecting the living and the dead. Now, every couple of years or so, the internet blows up with a sensational misconception. The famous Easter Island heads have bodies buried underneath. Actually, those headlines are true, but not for the reasons people think. It's a misconception. First, all of the Moai have bodies. Their heads may be disproportionately large, but absolutely none of them are just heads. All the ones people call heads are on the slopes of the Ranararaku crater quarry. And they are buried, but by soil erosion, not dropped in a hole and covered up. That's why some stick out from chest level, and others you can barely see their eyes peeping out. It's just differential levels of soil erosion accumulation around them. The few that were excavated to reveal their bodies, aside from freaking out the internet, provide some wonderful new evidence. Carving. The Moai who have been exposed to the elements for centuries are all eroded. Some of them show a little bit of carving, but the buried ones still have a lot of their original carving that we can still see. It's nothing earth-shaking. It's costume details, belly buttons, tattoos, hands folded in front of them. But it's still amazing to see the kinds of details they probably all once had. But okay, now to the question that everybody asks. How did they move them? That question was actually not even contemplated until the 1950s when Thor Heyerdahl showed up. Thor's famous voyage on his balsa wood and reed raft Contiki from South America into the Pacific was in 1947. He didn't make it all the way to Easter Island, but the journey started his interest in it and the culture that colonized it. Starting the first formal archaeological projects there in the 1950s, he was back again and again for the rest of his life. I guess because he was a man fixated on how ancient man did amazing things, like navigate the Pacific, he was the first to try to figure out how the Moai were moved. 
In the mid-1950s, he moved a moai on log rollers from the interior to the coast and then raised it up using rocks and levers. It worked. He proved that men with simple technology could do it. But was that how the Rapa Nui did it? All of the island's moai had fallen. Actually, they were pushed down by the Rapa Nui themselves, as I'll explain later. And Heyerdahl hired American archaeologist William Malloy to help, among other things, raise up some of them back onto their ahus. Malloy fell in love with the place, and the Rapa Nui people liked him very much. In fact, after he died, they erected a new moai to honor him. Talk about a piece of immortality. Malloy was among the first to really respect the Rapa Nui, and he asked them how they moved the moai. Their response was always that the moai walked from the quarry to their destinations. In 1986, Heyerdahl and Malloy invited Czech engineer Pavel Pavel to the island, and he was going to try out his theory about how walking could have actually been true. Standing a moai up, they lashed ropes all over it, and a crew of just 16 men gently rocked it back and forth, pulling slightly forward as they went. Waddling like a 20-ton duck, they moved it hundreds of yards forward in a relatively short period of time. They made the statue walk, just like the Rapa Nui said it could. That experiment was successfully repeated in Hawaii by Terry Hunt and Carl Lippo and published in their 2011 book, The Statues That Walked. So, it appears that the Rapa Nui didn't use witchcraft or the help of Atlantis or aliens. They did it themselves through their own impressive ingenuity. Okay, well, this is a good enough place to take a final break. When I return... I'll explain the mostly tragic episodes of European contact on Rapa Nui. And I'm going to get a little bit up on my soapbox here, so if you don't like that sort of thing, you should probably stop listening to the podcast here. The Ancient Maya Calendar I'm fascinated by it. And though I've been studying it for decades, I still learn new things about it all the time. I call it ancient, but I and literally millions of modern Maya people are still tracking it into modern time. Towards that end, I've created two products to help people better understand it. My annual Maya wall calendar and an iPhone app called simply Maya Calendar. Through these tools, you can figure out today's date or tomorrow's or a Maya date thousands of years in the past. The app will even calculate your Maya birthday and tell you about your personality traits and destiny according to modern Maya daykeeper priests. The Maya calendar app is available through iTunes, but both it and my annual Maya wall calendar are available through my website, mayan-calendar.com. That's mayan with an n-calendar.com. Check it out. Until the Europeans arrived, it seems to me that things were going great for the Rapa Nui. For an entire millennium, give or take a few centuries, the Rapa Nui had been living and prospering on Easter Island. Since their arrival from an ancestral homeland they called Hiva, probably the Marquesas Islands, they multiplied, established nine to maybe even twelve separate communities, and filled the shoreline with massive monuments to their honored ancestors. That all changed one fateful day in 1722. Three ships from the Dutch East India Company had been trying to find a direct route from South America all the way to Australia when they came upon the island. That day was April 5th, Easter Sunday, for the seafaring Christians, hence the name Easter Island. These Dutch traders landed on the island with over a hundred armed men and began assessing the resources there. They shot about ten Rapa Nui their first day just to make sure they kept their distance. They stayed about a week, noting the many standing moai and estimating the island's population at about 3,000 people. That 
3000 number has always struck me as wrong. Archaeological settlement evidence suggests about 15,000 people at its peak. So why did an accounting-oriented merchant ship miscount so badly? Three potential reasons come to mind. First, maybe much of the population was hiding. We know that later the entire population hid inside caves from slavers. My second idea is related to slavery. Perhaps they undercounted to keep the large population of potential slaves to themselves. Both the Dutch East and West India companies had been selling slaves for over a hundred years by 1722, and a fresh population of trapped and hidden away people on a remote island was probably seen as a treasure worth more than gold. Third, they could have been previously contacted by Europeans and their numbers dwindled through disease and starving. But if the 1722 account of their welcoming and curious behavior is true, then that may well have been first contact. Over the next 50 years or so, sporadic contact was made by various European ships. Some of them documented their visit, but most of the men who sailed the Pacific in those days were not really journalers. Dear Diary, Today I met some nice natives who carved funny giant statues, wrote no pirate ever. The 1774 James Cook expedition was the first to make a detailed report of the state of the island, complete with drawings and paintings of people in Moai. Again, the precise chronology of cultural changes on Rapa Nui is difficult to reconstruct, but Cook seems to have arrived at a pivotal time. Cook himself was actually too ill to even get off the ship, but his crew reported that some of the villages looked abandoned and that some of the Moai had fallen. Spanish expeditions just four years earlier made no mention of fallen Moai. But by 1825, the crew of the HMS Blossom found all the Moai down and learned that the natives themselves had pushed them down during a time of fighting between the villages. Another important clue to the demise of what some call the Moai cult was the deforestation of the island. The classic story of Rapa Nui told in the Western world is a cautionary tale one in which they irresponsibly cut down all of their trees and triggered a savage civil war. And importantly, all of that happened before European contact. But did it? The 1722 Dutch visit didn't mention any deforestation or disharmony. In fact, they called it an agriculturally rich paradise. It wasn't until the Cook expedition 52 years later that only small trees were noted. These days, there's a pretty solid theory that a Polynesian rat may have been responsible for the disappearance of the island's palm trees. They chewed at their roots until they died and fell over. But why didn't those rats chew up the palms and destroy the ecosystem hundreds of years earlier? There's a simple answer. They weren't there until the Polynesian island-hopping European ships brought them. Now, the fact that an ecological disaster happened, and that it resulted in a resource-driven warfare, is not only detected by botanical and archaeological studies, the Rapa Nui oral traditions themselves also remember it. The Rapa Nui people say that there were years of chaotic violence on the island that individual families hid and lived in tiny caves all over the island, with fathers foraging for food and defending their caves against attackers. It was an every-man-for-himself time, and the Moai were pushed down out of anger towards the ancestor spirits who no longer protected them. Things were only turned around by the establishment of what's been called the Birdman Competition. Each of the clan villages would offer up champions to participate. 
When a particular type of migratory tern rested on a tiny island off the southern coast, young men would paint their bodies white and race to be the first to return with an unbroken egg to a finish line on top of the Arango crater. The race was dangerous, with a scramble down a big cliff and then swimming through shark-infested waters. Attacking each other along the way was also fair game. Whoever won also won his village the right to allocate island resources for the year until the next year's competition. Red Bull actually considered recreating the race to advertise their brand, but when they really looked at it, they decided it was way too dangerous. But back to the point I was making. There are colleagues who would argue with me, but my read of the evidence is that it was European contact that put the Rapa Nui into their major cultural crisis, not ecological ignorance or irresponsibility. After all, they had been thriving for centuries before Europe arrived. The Birdman cult allowed them to regain community harmony, but that was unfortunately no help against the next wave of European invasions. 1862 was arguably the worst year in all of Rapa Nui's history. A fleet of Peruvian slave traders arrived at their shores. A delegation of chiefs rode out to negotiate and were immediately captured. Then, in short order, they abducted another 1,500 Rapa Nui, estimated to be fully half of the island's entire population. Slavery had been officially outlawed in Peru in 1854, so when the traders hit the mainland, they were punished immediately and told to return the Rapa Nui to their island. But tragically, some had contracted smallpox along the way, and when they returned, it swept across the island like a wildfire. Bodies piled up with no one left to bury them. French missionaries from Tahiti came to help, but one of them had tuberculosis and triggered another devastating wave of deaths. Then in 1871, a Tahitian landowner tricked the Rapa Nui queen into selling him the island, and he brought back another 500 Rapa Nui to Tahiti to work on his plantations. So between slavers and disease, by 1872, there were only 111 Rapa Nui people left on the entire island. That was a 97% population decrease in a single decade. Thankfully, a few hundred of them were repatriated from Polynesia and South America in the following decade, and today the Rapa Nui population is almost 5,000 people, but that's still a fraction of what it should be. In 1888, Chile claimed ownership of Rapa Nui and immediately leased it to a Scottish company named Williamson Balfour as a sheep farm. They built stone walls to subdivide the island into separate sheep pastures and another big wall to keep the Rapa Nui confined to the island's one town named Hangaroa. To this day, Hangaroa is the only town and virtually all people still live within its limits. A sad truth is that large portions of those walls were built with the stones from the foundations of ancient houses and other constructions. No study I've seen has ever tried to estimate just how much, but my own walks along those walls have identified many ancient cut stones. In 1953, after 65 years of sheep herding, the Chilean government finally canceled those leases and their navy took over management of the island. And in 1966, the Rapa Nui were actually given citizenship. But they were still not allowed to live anywhere but Hangaroa. So that brings us to the modern era, which has been better, but still a mixed bag for the Rapa Nui people in their island. Chile's infamous dictator Augusto Pinochet took over in 1973, and he was enamored with the island. Tourism really took off during his reign, well, at least for him and his rich buddies. 
He let Heyerdahl re-erect many Moai and expanded the airport to commercial flight capacity. In 1985, he allowed the U.S. to further expand the airstrip as a potential emergency landing place for NASA's space shuttles, and an even more expanded airport let tourism from all over the world start pouring in. But those tourists looked right through the island's residents, snapping photos of the Moai and talking about aliens and Atlantis. Chilean citizens from the mainland started moving in, buying up the land in Hangaroa to build hotels, restaurants, and tourism agencies. More and more, the Rapa Nui became the low-paid worker class of the island. Tourism was run by the Chilean Forestry Department, ironic for a treeless island, and the profits went back to the mainland. But then in 2015, the Rapa Nui had had enough. Led by a group called the Rapa Nui Parliament, they blocked the roads and demanded reforms. Specifically, they wanted new immigration laws and control over their own ancestral lands. And they won. Well, sort of. In 2017, Chilean President Michelle Bachelet gave control of the archaeological sites to a newly formed Rapa Nui group called Mauhanua. Then in 2018... President Sebastian Pinera signed a new Rapa Nui immigration law. Now no one of non-Rapa Nui heritage or through marriage can be permanent residents of the island. The ones that were already there were grandfathered in, but no one else can move in. So, it's a new dawn for the Rapa Nui people. After 140 years, they have control of their cultural patrimony again. I, for one, am thrilled for them and can't wait for my next trip to see how the Rapa Nui will choose to represent themselves to the world now. Let's hope this new chapter is a turn in the Rapa Nui's luck. You've been listening to Archeo Ed, a podcast written, produced, and distributed by me, Ed Barnhart. If you liked what you heard, then subscribe, like, share, comment, and do all those other things that I'm supposed to ask you to do. If you didn't, then don't do any of that stuff. And if you really liked it, support ArcheoEd through my Patreon account. I make these podcasts for free, but I am not opposed to financial support. Until next time, thanks for listening. All rights reserved. Copyright 2020.